Welcome to Lore Evolution, the series which explores the production history of our favourite factions, technologies and characters from the realm of sci-fi and fantasy. Today we're taking a look at everyone's favourite everyman engineer, perhaps the most important person in Starfleet history, Chief Miles O'Brien. Irish actor Cole Meany was with Star Trek The Next Generation from its very first episode. Although the character he played in the first episode Encounter of Farpoint is only retroactively the same man as Miles O'Brien, as his character is never named in Encounter of Farpoint, only referred to by his position, Con. Meany would make a handful of other appearances in The Next Generation's first season, but again only credited by his position, usually a transporter chief, but on occasion a security officer as well. It's also worth considering the different rank insignias and uniforms he appears in, as it's entirely possible these were meant to be different characters. Star Trek is known to often use a reliable pool of actors appearing in recurring roles, some of whom went on to play major characters, such as Jeffrey Combs and Susanna Thompson among others. It wasn't until the season 2 episode Unnatural Selection that O'Brien's name was first said on screen, but it took until the fourth season for his first name to be said. Originally the writers considered the name a Loisis, before Rick Berman suggested Miles, named after the producer's nephew. Something worth keeping track of in The Next Generation, and even with the subsequent spin-off, is O'Brien's rank, as it actually bounces around quite a bit. In his first appearance, his insignia suggests that of Ensign, but later appearances denote a lieutenant's rank, with O'Brien actually outranking both Worf and Geordi on occasion. Season 4, which gave Miles his full name, also revealed his status as a non-commissioned officer, as opposed to a Starfleet Academy graduate like the main characters. This was a suggestion by Ronald D. Moore, who wanted to add another dimension to Starfleet as an organisation and glimpse another side of the Star Trek universe. This was an approach to the character which other writers soon adopted, and O'Brien got his chance to shine. Episodes like Data's Day and The Wounded laid the groundwork for O'Brien's down-to-earth, relatable nature. While the main characters of the show were engaged in grand space adventures, significant time was dedicated to O'Brien's domestic life, with the character eventually marrying Keiko Ishikawa, played by Rosalind Chow, with the fictional couple even having a daughter, Molly, later on. But it was truly during the first appearance of the Cardassians where the dramatic potential of the character was first utilised. Thanks to the strong writing for the Cardassians in general, O'Brien's time as a soldier during the wars isn't portrayed as a tale of valiant heroism. Instead, O'Brien's much more grounded and much more human story of witnessing massacres and being consumed by guilt over taking another man's life is in stark contrast to the Roddenberry-esque superhumans in the rest of the cast. From then on, even when the stories were centred on other characters, O'Brien was often used as a reliable source of homely wisdom and useful practical advice. Not to mention Colmini's inherently charming and likeable presence made even the more technobabble-driven scenes extremely enjoyable. It was these factors which eventually led to him joining Star Trek's next spin-off show. For Deep Space Nine's co-creator Michael Piller, the decision to bring O'Brien over from the next generation to join the main cast was practically a no-brainer. Piller said, We've always thought he was a terrific performer, and now he's got something much more interesting to do as a main character on the show. He is pulling his hair out from one minute to the next because everything is breaking down. He can't get the replicators to make a good cup of coffee, his wife Keiko is terribly unhappy about having been taken off the Enterprise and over to this dreadful station, so he finds himself in an uncomfortable position. The other writing staff of the show were just as enthusiastic about expanding the character. Later DS9 showrunner Ira Stephen Bear said, O'Brien is the everyman. In a show about humans and aliens, he's as human as you get. Meanwhile, Robert Hewitt Wolf said, He's just a regular guy, a guy doing his job. He's the most unlikely of all heroes because he's a family man with a daughter and eventually a son and a wife, and they have arguments and a real relationship. He's just a working class schmo. The setting of Deep Space Nine itself further conveyed this idea in a visual sense, with O'Brien having to force Starfleet and Cardassian technology to cooperate. The character was often getting his hands dirty in the day-to-day. -day. In contrast to Geordi LaForge, who often did his work typing at a console and spouting technobabble, O'Brien always had his sleeves rolled up and an assortment of tools hanging out of his pockets. But as well as O'Brien's domestic duties both in his personal and professional life, the DS9 writers stumbled into a great friendship between O'Brien and the character of 
of Dr. Bashir. Ever since the season 3 episode Explorers, where the two sang the hymn Jerusalem, the writers all invested greatly in the relationship and were excited to explore it even further. Bashir actor Alexander Siddig said, It's been said, by even the producers, that O'Brien and Bashir are the only real friendship that's ever happened in Star Trek. These two really are friends. It's not like some kind of odd couple scenario like Spock and Kirk. It's a real friendship. These people talk about inane things, and I think it's really refreshing. Robert Hewitt Wolf further elaborated, saying, It was just great. There was just great chemistry between the two actors, great chemistry between the two characters. It was brilliant of Michael and Rick to create these two characters as foils for each other. And to then see this relationship develop over the years till they're best friends, till Miles actually likes Bashir kind of almost better than his wife some days. Which is very real, I mean, there's days where everybody, you know, it's easier to be friends with a friend than with your wife some days. Ira Stephen Bear went even further, stating, The relationship between Bashir and O'Brien is the best relationship, the best friend in the history of the franchise. Spock and Kirk were still about the captain and his number one. This is a friendship with two equals, two guys. It's a wonderful thing to watch how this relationship has grown. However, an unexpected side effect of O'Brien's everyman presence was the trend the writers developed of putting the character through absolute hell in several episodes. Episodes like Tribunal and Hard Time, among others, would see the character go through some kind of immensely difficult ordeal or sustain some kind of trauma. Ira Stephen Bear said, Every year in one or two shows we try to make his life miserable because you empathise with him. Robert Hewitt Wolf further explained, If O'Brien went through something torturous and horrible, the audience was going to feel that, in a way they wouldn't feel it with any of the other characters. Because all the other characters were sort of, I wouldn't say larger than life, but nobler than life. But O'Brien was just a guy trying to live his life and so if you tortured him, that was a story. Considering all these factors, the strong writing for the character, his relatable everyman nature, and Meanie's great performance, it's no wonder Miles O'Brien became a fan favourite character, and no wonder Star Trek Lower Decks named him as Perhaps the most important person in Starfleet history, Chief Miles O'Brien. Unlike many of the Next Generation or even Deep Space Nine main characters, viewers of both shows likely had far more in common with O'Brien than anyone else in these shows. From just another anonymous Starfleet crewman to a chief engineer and main character, O'Brien remains an enduring and refreshing character who left an important mark on the Star Trek universe. Ryder Lynch asks, What was it like writing your upcoming episode of The Sojourn? Was writing for an audio drama different from writing a film? Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Space Doc's original audio drama The Sojourn, uh, Volume 2, which is coming soon, I think, um, I guess wrote Episode 5 uh, of that, which uh, was very nice of them uh, to invite me to do that. And it was a really great experience. Uh, that's a really great team working behind that show, and it was awesome to collaborate with them. Um... For writing the episode that I wrote, it was a really cool experience to write in someone else's universe where they have their own kind of set rules and characters that behave a certain way. And it was cool to kind of do my own first draft and uh, see how they liked that and then kind of adjust it to fit more their creative vision and so on and so forth. But it was a really great collaborating with them. I had a great time doing that. And uh, yeah, writing for audio is quite different because, of course, with film, you have to consider, you know, you can't show you know you have to kind of tell in a way or you have to uh, give more audio cues to the audience to kind of uh, help them paint a picture of the scene in their mind as opposed to just describing on the page what will be seen by the camera because of course the camera isn't there so that was kind of a different experience but yeah overall I had a really great time writing it and um, I think it'll be a, a decent episode uh, you should check out the soldier in, in general and um, I hope you like the episode that I wrote Frank Chavez asks, If you were given the chance to helm the Star Trek franchise, would you be afraid of rejection from the fans? Uh, the answer is no. I've said this in a tweet uh, not, long, not too long ago, but you should never, ever, ever write anything or make anything for the fans because the fans are not one uniform group. There are millions of different people with millions of different opinions and frankly... It, most fans don't really know what they want. <laughs> you know, uh, Nicholas Meyer, the guy who directed The Wrath of Khan, has said this. And um, uh, David Sandberg, who directed uh, Shazam, has said a similar thing as well, where Nicholas Meyer said that 
you should only ever make something for yourself to meet your own standards because you're the only person that you know you can 100% satisfy creatively. And uh, David F. Sandberg, when uh, he was directing Shazam, uh, he told a story about uh, being on Reddit and finding two die-hard Shazam fans. And uh, one of them was telling him, you know, this is what you should do if you're doing a Shazam movie, you know, this is the direction you got to go in, and this is the only way to do, you know, a great Shazam movie. And then someone else replied to me going, no, no, that's completely wrong. Here's what you should do. And it was like what that person described was the complete opposite of what the first person described. And Sandberg was kind of like, well, one of you's going to be disappointed either way. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't... I think... If you're constantly, you know, thinking about, oh, but what will the fans think about this? What will they say about me on Twitter and things like that? I think it's just, you know, uh, a quick way to kind of creatively uh, cripple yourself, really, and kind of paralyze uh, the goals of your story and things. I think The Rise of Skywalker is like a good example of what appealing to the fans looks like, you know, rather than uh, sort of trying to satisfy the people who liked The Last Jedi, they were trying to kind of undo a bunch of things that The Last, the Last Jedi did, and they ended up satisfying no one, you know, so I think, no, never, I, I, you know, <laughs> the dream and the, <laughs> the virtually impossible scenario that I ever ended up helming the Star Trek franchise or having any kind of big say in what happens with Star Trek, uh, no, I wouldn't fear rejection from the fans because no matter what I do, someone's going to hate it and someone's going to say I'm, you know, an SJW or not a real fan or any other kind of buzzword no matter what I do. So, no, I don't really think about, well, what other people think of my work in general. Trevor Gano asks, what kind of music do you listen to? Um, lots of different things, really. Um, I really like Two Steps From Hell. Um, I listen to a lot of movie soundtracks. The band I'm listening to a hell of a lot right now is a band called Gunship. They're uh, very much a big homage to kind of 80s synth, but with modern production value, so it just sounds really, really awesome. And a lot of their work is inspired by, like, classic... 80s, you know, sci-fi movies and action movies and fantasy movies and things, and yeah, they're one of my favourite bands. They have just consistently great tracks out there, and uh, yeah, you should go listen to them if you're if you're into bassy, big bassy synthy stuff. I highly recommend Gunship. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members, where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which. I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.